Good evening, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo College. And welcome to the Folks Conversation Series. Tonight, what for better, lack of a better word, a luridly obscene conversation uh, involving the sex trafficking case, uh, ongoing sex trafficking case for several decades of, of, uh, of Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, demonstrating a, an incredible gross failure of, of the legal system to bring justice to victims and, in fact, to protect uh, future victims involving hundreds of girls uh, in locations as far flung as New Mexico, uh, Caribbean islands, uh, New York mansion. Uh, all of this was happening. Uh, the legal system failed, and there was a lot of indifference elsewhere. And we're going to talk about that. People knew and somehow ignored it. Um, if you uh, still wish to receive CLE credit for tonight, uh, you can go to the chat box and there'll be information about that. Uh, if, uh, you can also use the chat box to interact with each other uh, online. If you have questions for our guests, you can uh, leave that on the Q&A question and answer button as well. Uh, we have a wonderful, fabulous, uh, and esteemed group of experts on uh, Jeffrey Epstein. I, I suspect that they wish that this case never happened, so they didn't have to know so much about this. Uh, we have two of the attorneys uh, who represented victims of Jeffrey Epstein. First, we have Sigrid McCauley. Sigrid, say, wave to our audience. Hi. There she is. Uh, Sigrid uh, represented a number of the victims. She's also, um, has, you know, it's clear that this is a passion of hers. She serves, to my understanding, as a board of director and trustee of a number of nonprofits that deals with sexual violence to children. So Sigrid is here, thank you. Um, Spencer Kuvin is here also. Uh, Spencer was, there he goes. Uh, Spencer is- uh, an How are you doing? Here. Thank you for having me. Happy to have you here, Spencer. Uh, an attorney specializing in a number of areas uh, of litigation, but this in particular, uh, and also clearly a passion of Spencer. Uh, Lisa Bryant, uh, who is the executive producer uh, and the director of a new film uh, that was a premiered on Netflix in May uh, called Filthy Rich. There it is. Uh, that is itself a very compulsive and, and evocative photo. This film uh, is a compulsive watch. It's incredibly bingeable. <coughs> if, you don't, if you don't have uh, 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 Netflix, now's the time to get it. I certainly watched it. It's a docu-series, but I watched it in one sitting. Uh, and it's astonishing. It is truly an astonishing film uh, that reveals uh, the inner workings of an incredible cover-up. Uh, and that's what we'll be discussing today. Uh, so that's Lisa Bryant. And lastly, Mark Fisher. Mark Fisher. Mark, wave to the audience. There he is. Uh, Mark is a senior writer and editor at the Washington Post, where he received two Pulitzer Prizes uh, for his reporting. He's author of a number of books, one of which that I remember reading in the mid-90s on the collapse, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, so welcome, Mark. And of course, Mark covered uh, the Epstein case for the Washington Post. Welcome, all of you. Thank you so much for joining us at Folks. Um, uh, let's really, you know, give the audience something that they have not seen, even in Lisa's film. Let's give them a real sense of the details of, of this just just astonishing story. So astonishing, Mark. Let me start with you. I, I don't understand why we never heard more about this. I don't understand why this wasn't a bigger story. Um, when I think of this case, and I think, and if you haven't seen Lisa's movie, and you don't know much about this, you'd be surprised to know that a United States president was involved in this. A prime minister of Israel had some involvement. A, crime, a crown prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, a prince of the United Kingdom, a Harvard law professor. Uh, the cast of characters are long, either people who were directly involved or were complicit in not uh, calling attention to what happened. I don't see why this isn't a bigger story than the OJ case or the Bernie Madoff case or the Elliot Spitzer case, or for that matter, the Sandusky the Joe Paterno case in Penn State. This seems to me like a blockbuster, and Lisa's film really reveals that. W speaking as a reporter, uh, why can you tell us why this just story never resonated? 
Well, I, I think to some extent it did. I mean, uh, certainly for folks in South Florida, this was a huge story going back quite some years. The Palm Beach Post did superb reporting going back quite a number of years on this story, uh, going back to the original complaints by the detectives and the police chief in Palm Beach, uh, who uh, were upset with the way this worked out and, and the way Epstein got off. But you're absolutely right that it didn't break nationally in the way that you might have expected. Did, like CNN, did CNN ever spend spend weeks on this? No, like but MSN. because it's, it's, it's really, you know, once you get, there's the obvious uh, sexual aspect, which uh, it, it makes it a, a big tabloid story and very attractive to television. Um, but once you get beyond that, it's a very complicated financial story. If you want to trace Epstein's crimes going back to the 1980s, and that's obviously not something that most television uh, news operations would be terribly interested in. Uh, but I think what this really does reflect is the collapse of our uh, regional and local news infrastructure in the country. We've seen uh, a, a near total collapse of the news industry in many parts of the country. And so the old methods by which a local story made its way into the national spotlight have virtually vanished. And uh, those pipelines aren't there anymore. Um, we started reporting on this uh, on the Epstein story at, at the Washington Post about five years ago, and I, I did a number of stories and, and was, like you, somewhat surprised that they weren't uh, picked up on more. Um, you know, some of the uh, Tim Kaine read parts of one of my stories in an, in an attempt to question Alex Acosta at his confirmation hearing. That sort of thing did happen. Uh, but really, it uh, over time, I think it wasn't until uh, some of the more lascivious um, allegations and until some of the victims came forward uh, and there was really a face and a voice uh, for Epstein's victims that we began to see uh, a real national obsession with this. But, but, those, but those faces were available. <laughs> You know, not entirely. No, not. I mean, only in the last few years. Uh, really, prior to that, uh, a good number of the women were extremely reluctant to come forward. Uh, certainly, publicly, uh, they were in the initial uh, court cases. Uh, they were operating under pseudonyms um, or or under no name, and so um, you know, which we all respected and, and, and obviously left their names out of stories, but that made it a less sexy, so to speak, story, uh, certainly for television and certainly for uh, some of the, the more tabloid aspects of the media. So, so Sigrid and, and, Thane, and Spen Yeah, yeah Thane, I can tell you that, you know, I filed one of the first cases back in 2007 on behalf of the first victim to actually step forward to police and report this. She was 14 years old at the time. And we purposely, obviously, kept her name as a pseudonym, as, as a Jane Doe. But we worked very closely with the Palm Beach Daily News, which is a small uh, piece of the Palm Beach Post here in Palm Beach County. And they circulate primarily on the island. And one of the strategies we actually used in the original filing was for me to feed stories to the Palm Beach Daily News, because I knew that Mr. Epstein's friends and and cohorts there on the island were reading, you know, this particular newspaper. So we did use that, and there were a number of very good reports that came out of that. But um, you know, like Mark identifies, we were shocked and really kind of surprised that no one really ever picked up on this story beyond really well, the Palm Beach community. I As you know, I live in New York, uh, and uh, and everyone here knew Jeffrey Epstein for for all sorts of reasons. And one would think that at the very time, at the very time that the Palm Beach Daily News, whatever that division of the Post was covering the story that people would have picked up on that at the New York Post, and for whatever reason, uh, they didn't. Sigrid, uh, let, let, me, let me go to you next, and then maybe Spencer will jump in too. Tell us where we are legally. Uh, there's a number of different cases. It's, it is confusing. After Jeffrey Epstein's death, uh, the, the criminal case against him was dismissed. Um, right. Uh, my understanding is that 24 hours before he died, uh, 2,000 pa pages of prior uh, pr uh, uh, sealed documents became available. Whatever happened to those two pa 2,000 pages of sealed documents? I know that the judge had essentially said to the claimants, the victims, "Look, if you want to bring cases now against co-conspirators, you're welcome to do that." But this man is now dead. At the same time, we understand that Epstein had transferred all of his money. Uh, to, into a trust. So he obviously was thinking before his death that he wanted to protect the money from any potential claimants. Um, 
there's still a number of other cases that out there. So help us explain, untangle for us where we are legally and where we can expect to be for your victims and other victims. Sure, you're right, absolutely, that the landscape of the litigation is very broad at this point. Uh, there are a number of things going on. You have certain of the victims who filed their own federal cases in the Southern District of New York. I represent uh, quite, quite a few of those. Um, we also have a claims program going on right now that was set up by the Epstein um, the Epstein estate and the, and the victims, along with um, the help of the U.S. Virgin Islands AG, uh, to kind of bring the parties together and see if there can be some resolution there for uh, those people who suffered at the hands of Jeffrey Epstein. So that's going on. Uh, the Maxwell case that you referenced, the Jufre v. Maxwell case with the releasing of the documents, that's still in play presently. Um, and those documents are, are being reviewed by the court and those decisions are still being made. So from a litigation perspective, while Jeffrey Epstein is, is deceased, this is still ongoing. There is still a lot um, left to be done uh, from a litigation perspective. Spencer, so are you, you're involved in these cases as well. I, I was also curious, Correct. maybe one of you can explain. So the 2008 plea deal that Acosta, and we'll maybe try to explain that more as, as we talk more about this, but that original deal, the sweetheart deal that uh, Epstein received in 2008, uh, a federal judge has re looked at that again and vacated that, that, that ruling. And that is a, is that, am I right? And that's a federal judge in New York that vacated the ruling of 2008, which essentially uh, provided immunity for any of the federal charges uh, and sealed the indictment and, of course, made sure that victims, your clients, were never informed of this sweetheart deal. So if that immunity deal was essentially removed, at this point, it, does it make a difference at all, given the fact that Epstein's dead? Well, it's a little bit different. So there was an, a Crime Victims' Rights Act. It's a federal law. And one of the victims uh, filed under the National Crime Victims' Rights Act to unseal that deal, like you say. It was actually here in the Southern District of Florida. There was a federal judge, Mara, who and then that's 2014, ruled... let me just, am I right? Correct, correct. Okay. So, and, and what Judge Mara ruled was that essentially the deal was invalid. Now, that was then appealed up to the 11th Circuit, which is the federal appellate court for Florida. Now, the 11th Circuit uh, sits in a three-judge panel, and they reversed Judge Mara's decision and then revalidated, essentially, the plea deal. And now that is under appeal now to have the entire panel of the 11th Circuit rehear that issue. So it is still in flux right now. And actually, what Sigrid had said off camera, that she actually thinks that case may actually end up in the United States Supreme Court. Correct. I, I believe it actually may end up ultimately at the U.S. Supreme Court. What's interesting, though, is that Glenn Maxwell, and I know Sigrid is uh, you know, litigating against her now, she was never specifically a part of that deal, surprisingly. While immunity was given under that deal to co-conspirators, she was not specifically named in that deal. So, so for the cases that are proceeding against her, even that earlier immunity deal, even if it was upheld, would not apply to her. It should not. It should, it should not. not. Correct. So, uh, Spencer, so what about, um, so there were a number of cases that, in fact, were settled by Epstein, right? I mean, I'm trying to, Correct. I was trying to, it's so tangled, right? Uh, you've had clients, Sigrid had clients, there were a number of other attorneys had clients. Epstein had settled some of those cases. Uh, right. Are there new cases that are, in fact, even being brought at this time, or they or are they stopped from bringing it because Epstein is dead? No, and, and in fact, Sigrid mentioned this, but there is this claim uh, fund that was established with the assistance of the you know, Virgin Islands um, with the U.S. attorney down there and the trust he was trying to set up to shield over you know, half a million or half a billion dollars. And that claim fund is now open to all potential victims, including those victims that had previously settled their claims. And the reasoning behind that is because a lot of my clients back then were under extreme pressure. Uh, they were being followed in black uh, vans. Their family members were being questioned by investigators of Epstein and pressured. Uh, they were being asked, you know, illicit questions. Their boyfriends were being asked about sexual conduct and, and activities of these poor girls. 
And these are girls that are 15 and 16 at the time. So, so but why, why should that matter? That's interesting, but why should that matter? Because they were pressured into what we believe at the time, and I know at the time, frankly, to resolve their cases for less than what we felt was a good value for those cases and what I they see. should have done. And they should have taken these cases to trial. But, you know, when a young 17-year-old girl is sitting in your office crying hysterically about what's happening to her life around her, and she says, I want this case over, I don't care anymore, then, you know, unfortunately, they're being pressured. So I, so, so what... Well, go ahead. I'd like to add that when we were talking about why this wasn't widely known back in 2008, it's because Epstein did not want it known. It was intimidation right. tactics, they tactics from his high-powered attorneys, the high players that you mentioned early on. That's the reason that nobody really heard about it and didn't pick up on it, other than maybe the Palm Beach. He was trying to intimidate the 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 newspapers in Palm Beach. He was intimidating the girls. That this attorneys were tearing down their um, reputations you know, intimidation, fear factors so that they wouldn't come forward. Um, and then it would have been a bigger deal. You have to remember there were, you know, at least three dozen girls that went forward and with, with to the police department, you know, and through their questioning, they were listed in this indictment that the FBI basically, you know, tossed aside and they came and gave him a slap on the wrist. So his intimidation yeah. and Epstein did Word. not want that story out. So and even, those, very even same after, tactic, those very same Mark, tactics were used by uh, Epstein's lawyers against the prosecutors in Alex yes. Acosta's U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami. So uh, you see a pattern there where he's using aggressive tactics, investigating the prosecutors' personal lives, following them around, talking to their uh, significant others and to others, other people in their lives. Uh, so uh, you know, there's really the very solid pattern of harassment and so uh, aggressive tactics. So Sigrid yeah. Spencer, are you so, I, I hope I, I make it clear to the audience. You're saying that given the work of the uh, AG's office in the U.S. Virgin Islands, that essentially the putting of the Epstein funds in trust didn't work to insulate Correct. the corpus of, of, uh, of, from future claims, not only from even future claims, but what, what Spencer said, even flame, claims that had already been settled and resolved can be reopened. So essentially, all of your clients could have uh, access to that corpus, uh, including all the other cases that have been filed. Correct. Yeah, that's see. absolutely and correct. That, and that, and of course, that doesn't even include Maxwell, right? That's, some, right. that's altog altogether yet another source of wealth. Uh, correct. Lisa, Lisa, so you, we've, you just described what, you know, the nightmare of this, right? Everyone was threatened, right? Uh, you know, this was a real shakedown, like literally mafia style. If you really think I about can, it. And, and not to interrupt, but Thane, I can tell you that e even after the infamous deposition that I took of him that's been posted online and was in Lisa's documentary, you know, I had to defend against a personal Florida bar complaint that he filed against me. Right, so during the litigation, I had right. to defend myself and my reputation and my license because he was trying to intimidate me at the time. So Lisa, your film... Uh, what was the pushback on that? How, when did you start? Uh, and clearly he must have known, uh, given the fact that you were interviewing everyone, including his former gardener in the Virgin Islands. Uh, everybody seemed to know about this. Uh, what did he do? What did he try to do? Did any of it succeed? You know, he really didn't. I think by that point, uh, I really feel, and, and everybody that we've talked to, I'm sure you all would, would, would agree, he really thought he was above the law. He had gotten away with it for so long. Um, he really wasn't afraid. We started the project um, with Netflix and Radical Media and Joe Berlinger and James Patterson kind of all in collaboration. He was, when we did it, it was early uh, 2018 and he was alive and well, very wealthy. Um, you know, we took great precautions to make sure that he didn't shut it down. We uh, had a locked room that we worked in. Our edit suites were different than everybody else's. We had uh, like a, a secret server, if you would, where we had our communication so that he couldn't hack in. We had cameras in the room, a safe. We took great precautions. Didn't see that, um, you know, real intimidation. I did knock on his door several times. We were tracking his flights. And when he was in Palm Beach, I would go buzz the buzzer. Um, we actually did see him come and go from and got some video of him leaving the apartment in Manhattan, you know, with a woman. I know he took my, my own license plate, um, but I never really did hear anything. Um, interestingly, the only thing that I would consider a threat happened after he was arrested. We weren't, were at the island. We knew there was going to be a raid. 
And um, I, when I was there, we took a, a boat ride around the island and thought, well, it looks really empty. It should look empty, right? He's behind bars. So as we pull up to the dock, we think we're, we're going to at least go on the public beach. We're not going to go on that private island. We're not going to break the law. But as soon as we got close to that dock, these four ATVs come steaming down towards us. And they had guns. And they basically pointed their guns at us, shooing us off there. And we, we took off like a bat out of you know what? So that to me was was threatening and showing you that even behind bars, he is still, you know, running the show. He is in power. He is powerful. And those people are still running, you know, his islands is, is all these mansions, you know, all over the world. So his worldwide scope. Yeah, it's, and, it's so it's interesting to think about that. He didn't even go after Netflix, right? He could have Think about the influence he might have tried to But he, he did not. And, and at that time, the <laughs> Miami Herald was doing their great investigative reporting, came out, um, you know, shortly after we began our project. So that really, the focus of that, um, you know, was what got this going again. And, and now the rest of Elaine Maxwell and, the, and now the world knows through the Netflix, the power of Netflix yeah. and, and the wide platform, I think. And they're outraged. The people are outraged. And I think hopefully that pressure, you know, got the FBI to act more quickly. I know they were on it, but I, I do think that there's been so much attention recently uh, on her that, you know, <clears throat> they'll go after other co-conspirators. Yeah. Lisa, okay. yeah, Lisa I, when you mo mentioned a moment ago, you said, look, he must have at, at some point believed that he was above the law. I was thinking about how in your film, uh, his jet, which appears uh, often, is, was <coughs> called the Lolita Express. Now, I, I just can't think of anything that is more self-condemning is if you named your jet the Lolita Express, uh, you know, you're sending a real message of what its purpose was for. Uh, and if, he if the nickname of Pedophile Island or Orgy Island. And, yeah, you know, Orgy Island. And, named them himself or that just got to be, um, you know, it just speaks to the, um, you know, the horrific nature of his crimes. Yeah. Mark. Uh, maybe the others can jump in as well. I, I think the audience would be interested in knowing I was interested. Some of it comes out in Lisa's film. Where is this wealth? You know, he had, there was talk that he was a billionaire. It appears that he wasn't a billionaire. He obviously had hundreds of millions of dollars because in addition to, you know, a ranch in New Mexico, one of the largest private residences in Manhattan, uh, an island in the Caribbean, uh, you know, incredible lavish gifts to universities and research institutions, payoffs to all of these entities, right? Everyone was being paid off. Somebody, I mean, you know, gifts were being given to the Palm Beach Sheriff's Department, right? I mean, there were all kinds of checks written over the years. Where did the, where did it come through? This is not a college graduate. Let's, right. let's, let's be clear. He was not a college graduate. He started out uh, teaching at a private school here in Manhattan for which he was fired. And then he ended up with a job on Wall Street and then he makes some meteoric ar arise. So can we just, some of us just briefly set up where all of this wealth came from and what do we think the wealth ended up constituting? He was indeed, as you said, a, a college dropout, a Brooklyn kid who uh, had, uh, by all accounts, a real uh, talent at math uh, and uh, was... Uh, kind of bouncing around and ended up teaching math at the Dalton School on New York's uh, Upper East Side. Uh, and he had uh, some of the most powerful people in New York sent their kids there. And he happened to be tutoring the son of the chairman of Bear Stearns, uh, which uh, created a connection that got him a job at Bear Stearns. So he left uh, Dalton uh, and uh, and began this career uh, and very quickly got in trouble. He, he left Bear Stearns uh, very shortly after arriving there, after the SEC started looking into some improper loans that uh, he had made to a friend. Uh, yeah, so but, it, but it didn't affect his bosses because they ended up investing with him. Absolutely. So he had a way with people. He had a, a way of... Uh, a, getting across as many abusers do the ability to groom young girls was very similar to the way he brought celebrities entertainers uh lawyers and uh, academics into his circle um and created the perception that he was someone of great charisma great wealth someone who uh, through whom they could learn a lot and be part of a high-powered crowd so, so wait, let and me just stop you for a second because you've raised something that i have not thought of or heard before which is that some of his cultivating skills transcended him even writing any checks. 
Absolutely. Like, I, and and uh, the, the checks, I, I think it's easy to fall into the trap of believing that he got where he did by spreading money around. What he spread around was the promise and the aura and the thought of money. Uh, many of the pledges that he made to various charities, he never fulfilled. Uh, many of those gifts, uh, even to Harvard, uh, he promised them many millions of dollars. He gave them one significant gift. Uh, and and they were hoping for the rest and pushing for the rest and therefore continued to meet with him and gave him an office and gave him a title and all of the things that they gave him in an effort to further, uh, to, to get more money from him, which was never forthcoming. So, so, so again, again and again, we see the sort of con man at work here. Right. Well, the other thing, Lisa, in the film, there's an extraordinary moment where Leslie Wexner, which essentially, it seems to me that the original funding for him, what really developed his aura as a multimillionaire was a theft from the Wexner Foundation that he was actually held, he was the trustee or the director of it. And Wexner essentially in your film says, well, it's, you know, he, I think he stole from me. And it was those, those that original stealing was the, essentially the corpus from which everything else grew. Yeah, definitely. I think he's really his only known client of record, really. And um, the big... And wait, just this, I'm sorry. Everyone should know Wexner is the limited and Victoria's Secret, right? Right. And well, former, former CEO. He's now, since all of this, like many people, distance themselves. They've had to step down from powerful positions like the Prince, uh, Prince Andrew over in, in Great Britain. Um, but yes, Wexner... It's a big mystery still. I think those mysteries could come out. We might learn some of them in the, in the papers, who knows? But um, I think that nobody can understand how, you know, Wexner really was a true billionaire, multi-billionaire who would, you know, be so enamored by this young an up and comer and be so, uh, you know, enticed into giving him, he signed over power of attorney to him. I know, and, extraordinary. And then didn't even really check what he was doing with his money because then we, we later learn, and Leslie Wexner admits, uh, that he stole, you know, 47, $50 million from him. And, you know, he's embarrassed by it. And, and I think there's more to that story that will, will come out probably, you know, in the coming months. And, and then in your film, there's the Ponzi scheme with Towers Financial Corp, right? People, most people don't think about, they think of Madoff's Ponzi scheme. But actually, Epstein, many years earlier, yeah. was, again, one, that's the point I was raising with Mark. There were things always happening to this guy, and they were never good, right? And they, they should have, in my mind, like, wait, there was a Ponzi scheme? Not only that, it seems that w at some point he started a fund, the liquid funding, which was the early adopters of what we then became mortgage-backed securities and collateral debt obligations. Epstein was early to that, that dance that yeah. ended up, you know, tanking the United States economy in 2008. Epstein was early in those packaging of those financial instruments, toxic. He slithered away, and he slithered away free. And, and you know, and Stephen Hoffenberg, you know, says, you know, he took the fall for him, whether that, you know, we, he, he admits he did, you know, do the crimes as well. But he said Epstein was his, basically his right-hand man right alongside. But somehow, how did, how did he, um, you know, convince him to take the fall, and, and as Hoffenberg says, and, yeah. you know, and, and we, know, we know from Too Big to Fail, right, from if you've seen the film or the book, you know that Bear Stearns no longer exists, right? This is an important point. That just let's just, so just to keep the story going. Bear Stearns didn't exist. This is the point that Mark said, well, he started out at Bear Stearns, and the people that were his bosses at Bear Stearns still invested with him and ended up in partially through his investments with him, tanking the whole firm. And through those connections with Bear Stearns, the other connections he'd made in uh, high powered New York circles, he was able to uh, stage really his first great escape, which really set the pattern for the rest of his life. And that was in that tower investment scam. This is a scam that ripped off hundreds of thousands of Americans, retirees, widows. This is the Ponzi scheme? Uh, this is a Ponzi scam that Steve Hoffenberg served 18 years in prison for. But if you go back and look at the original documents where the prosecutors laid out the case, it's clear that the architect of the scheme 
is Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein is mentioned again and again as the author of that scheme, and then suddenly he vanishes from the paperwork. He, he, all of the legal filings uh, at, at a certain point shift from naming Jeffrey Epstein to calling to, to mentioning an unnamed co-conspirator. And that uh, it, it's really quite reminiscent of what happened in Miami with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And uh, Hoffenberg says that this happened uh, because Epstein cooperated with the prosecutors and turned right. against Hoffenberg. Well, well, let Spencer maybe, because he was actually in the courtroom, let, let, let Spencer sort of give us the drama in a short little description of what you mean by that, right? That what you saw with Hoffenberg, right. the great escape, is a great escape that you saw here with the United States Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Florida with the Acosta sweet, sweetheart deal. Uh, just give us some background as to what actually happened with that, Spencer. So we knew that the prosecution was going on at the time that all of this was happening, and we were trying to get information out of the U.S. Attorney's Office, but they weren't being any you know, forthcoming at all. And during that process, eventually the victims were saying, look, you know, if we're not going to get answers from the U.S. Attorney's Office, please file suit on our behalf in civil court. So uh, we did. And at that point, um, you know, we're ready to serve the complaint on Epstein. But how do you serve a man who's like the ether? He's all over the world. And I got a tip uh, from somebody who I had been working with at the time uh, in uh, police enforcement that something was going to happen and to go down to the courthouse and find out what was going on. So with my process server, we rushed down to the courthouse. And as I enter the courthouse going through the metal detector, at the same exact time, Jeffrey Epstein and his attorneys are walking through the metal detector to go up to the courtroom. We get up there. We don't know anything about what's going to happen. But the courtroom, when we arrive, is packed. It's filled with attorneys, you know, people with notepads, taking notes, and one camera. And we walk and wait, in. Wait, wait, but Spencer, one second. And no victims. No victims whatsoever. Right. Right. No, Just to be cool. right. Okay. Absolutely none. And we walk in. And as I walk in, I sit down in one of the benches waiting to see what's going to happen. And Mr. Epstein walks up to the, the court, essentially with his lawyer. And they say to the court that they have a plea deal. And he gives what's called a colloquy, which is basically an admission. Yes, Your Honor, I agree that I committed these acts. And then oddly, at one point, Counsel for Epstein says, may we approach the bench? And the judge says, yes. They approach the bench and the judge turns on a sound machine so that nobody can hear what's happening at that moment. So they're up at the bench and it's Epstein, the state's attorney and his lawyer talking to the judge. We don't know what they were saying during that moment. But he we then know. Just, he backs away and at that point, the judge accepts the plea, he's handcuffed, and he's taken off. And remember, when this I, the, key, the key to this is to keep the audience to understand. This is the plea that was essentially an immunity from the federal charges. It correct, resulted, correct. It, it resulted in a sealed indictment. And even more importantly, none of the victims were given any notice of that this deal. And it was a deal in which he was serving time essentially at home. Correct. And, actually, and we, we learned later, and, and by the way, this, this even went on for another year before we actually learned what was in that deal. We only learned later that the U.S. attorney not only gave him the sweetheart deal, but they agreed to keep it private so that even the victims and the victims' attorneys like myself couldn't learn what was in the deal. Right. I had right. to file a motion with the court just to get a copy of what the deal was. Right. And then when I won, they appealed it and tried to prevent us from getting it on behalf of the victims. It and took again, us years to get it. The unprecedented nature of that deal. Sigrid, maybe you can also address this as well, but one of the things I also, I also wanna hear from you, there's a wonderful moment in Lisa's film where you're coming into the courthouse with your clients uh, here in the Southern District of New York, and the clients are actually holding hands. The girls are holding hands. It's just a wonderful scene. It's, it's subtle, but you can't miss it. Um, so I would like you at some point to describe what are they feeling at this point? You know, uh, what can justice look like for them? Uh, Epstein is dead. Good. They're able to go after the corpus of his wealth. But is there the possibility of justice given all that's happened and not happened? 
I think there were a few things going on that day, and it was one of the most powerful days in my career uh, so, thus far, certainly. And that was that Judge Berman had invited these victims, which is unprecedented, to come into the courtroom in federal court in the Southern District of New York, hear the government uh, talk about the fact that they were gonna have to conclude that case since he had died in prison, but Judge Berman allowed those victims to each stand up one by one and speak their truth, tell their story about how they were abused so severely by Epstein and those who surrounded him. One by one, those women stood up with great courage and made those statements. And I will tell you that when we got to go back uh, to meet with the prosecutors in the back and the, the group uh, where the judge had, had left off the group, uh, those women said to me, a number of them, this has been more important than anything else that I've ever been through because it was an acknowledgement by a federal judge that I am hearing you. I believe you, your voice matters. So for all of the other things that happened and, and the, the terribleness of them not getting to see him stand trial, that moment gave them so much liberty and peace. Right, and Sigrid, just to be clear, so the audience understands, with no legal significance, right? Correct. It's very important to understand that what you're describing is something they're saying was as extraordinarily meaningful and yet actually had no legal significance. It was there simply to give them a day in court, an actual day in court. Now, did Berman, the judge, was he also taking into account what Spencer just said in a way? He's essentially saying, you know, this has been a cover up from the very beginning. And that given the fact that, you know, it, that deal in 2008 involved Spencer having to file a lawsuit to even find out what was in it. And then they appealed that. Not this thing has been so buried for the love of God. Let these women speak. Yes, Judge Bourbon was such a hero in that moment because I have not seen that from other federal judges. It's just unheard of to have that kind of a proceeding. So for him to allow those women to come in and have that moment was just incredibly powerful. It was a proud moment for me as a lawyer, as a part of the judicial system to see it working the right way in that, in that moment. So yes, it was um, certainly something that was, had, had great significance to these women. And I was, uh, I was in the courtroom too, and I, I, I was, chilled. I had tears. I had met a few of these women, Sarah, Virginia, some, uh, Michelle and Courtney, some of these women that are in the film I had just barely met or had been talking to. But to see them, what a moment uh, as an outsider. Um, really, I was just so proud of each and every one of them, as, as Sigrid, I'm sure you were, that they finally had their voice uh, because they were denied that for so many years. And, and I, I've never, of course, experienced anything like that. And, and Sigrid, to hear you say that, you know, you're in the courtroom, certainly much more than I am. But, you know, I just really feel so lucky to have been there. And I'm so proud of ev everyone in that room who came forward, the courage it took, even at that point, to speak out. So Sigrid, you said a moment ago, heroes. You would say Judge Berman would be one. I'm wondering, are there others? You know, this case is reeking, this whole story reeks with moral failure. Forget legal failure, moral failure, uh, human failure. <laughs> it's just failure. Uh, if you watch Lisa's film, I got a feeling that the uh, Palm Beach Sheriff's Department, th there are moments there of, of true crusading uh, interest. There is the some of the private investigators who were involved. Can you sort of tell us, give us at least some happy moments that there are some people that walk away. I would say the lawyers, in your case, you represented the women and you represented them for the purposes of giving them a voice. Um, you didn't know what there, if there was going to be money at the end of this. You just described, Sigrid, an experience that was one of your proudest moments in a courtroom and you didn't get paid for it. Um, so that, that's, that's an indication that of, of heroism. But it, are there others? Yes. I mean, there's so many. First of all, the women. You take someone like Maria Farmer, who back in the mid-90s was the very first person to report Epstein and Maxwell and that abuse um, and stood up to them and was, was haunted by them for many years thereafter. I mean, those are the heroes, the women who had the voices to come forward and try to stop this. Uh, Virginia crusading on behalf of many of, of the women to try to get them to come forward and, and speak their truth. And then so many of the others, the lawyers from the very beginning, I mean, Spencer's one of them, 
Brad Edwards, Paul Cassell, who stuck with this for many, many years and fought on behalf of these victims. And then I think some of the journalists, because when I got into the case, I will tell you that the media was very unfriendly to Virginia, who was my first client. I mean, in such a way that they used words that are just unacceptable in my book, and I couldn't talk them off of it, uh, no matter how hard I tried. So I felt like it was a very unreceptive environment. That was in the 2015 timeframe. And then there was a shift and you saw some heroes in the media like Julie Brown digging into the story, Lisa digging into the story, all of these people coming together to try to really build it out. You know, people like Mark, people were paying attention. And so, so there's that section of heroes in the media as well that tried to really bring light to this darkness. And, and at the expense of having to face Epstein, who was, you know, not an easy person to face um, and would come after people. So along the way, um, I think there's just been a number of heroes detective writer. I mean, those folks that stuck with it and fought against, you know, they had, they had people following them. Here they are police officers or law enforcement, and people are following them. And then you look at the, the Southern District of New York prosecutors. I mean, heroes, they've continued to pursue this despite it having been folded in the Southern District of Florida years before, right? Am I, am I right that the FBI shut down their investigation in 2008, that they were prepared at that point, they only identified 34 girls? but that they were prepared to go find more, but that the sweetheart deal that Spencer just described actually just shut down that entire investigation. And is that in your mind, another example of the heroes that we're not aware of? Well, correct. I mean, that, that investigation got shut down. And I will tell you, I've heard from folks who were close to that investigation that they were, they were very upset by that. They wanted, you know, they had met with these women, they wanted to see this case go forward and unfortunately it didn't. So yes, I mean, along the way, but that also shows the Epstein machine, right? The fact that it can shut down a government investigation, the power there is so significant. Yeah. And I just it reaches one, internationally. Yeah, just just have, go one, ahead, one, ad, one additional group of uh, possible heroes there. Um, we, you've mentioned uh, the Palm Beach police chief, Michael uh, yeah. Ryder. Uh, to Sigrid's point, he was instrumental in turning the, the news coverage uh, against Epstein. He was he felt uh, terribly abused by the non-prosecution deal that Acosta but, made. No, no, but Mark, here's something I just remembered. Please explain this. He was upset for what happened three years before that with the state attorney's office, right? That right. the state attorney in exactly. Florida basically, you know, I, I don't know, he must have received Very some quick, pain yeah. con Right, he, mm -hmm. he, he, he he had no interest in this case. And I think the, the sheriff was right. actually yeah. shocked that the, the main state prosecutor had no interest in the case. So I think he felt burned by the prosecutors even three years before. That's absolutely right. And the police chief was also standing up for his detectives, Detective Rick Haray, who really, I think, was the first uh, police uh, officer who listened to the, the, the girls in a serious way, unfortunately did not live to see the, 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 how the case turned out. Uh, but his uh, investigative work was absolutely instrumental. And he and then his police chief on behalf of him uh, really drove this uh, on, on, the, on the, the press side. Uh, and I think uh, were, were very important in turning some of that initial skepticism that Sigrid uh, described uh, around. I, I can also tell you, you know, Joe Joe uh, is a former was a former New York police detective who was essentially trying to live a quieter life in Palm Beach as a police officer. He really took this case to heart and interviewed yeah. a number of girls. And, you know, when I sat with him for the first time to talk to him about the case, I can remember him almost being in tears looking over his shoulder because he said that people were picking through his trash can. People were looking through his mail. They were following him around. You know, Epstein had hired investigators to investigate the police, and yeah. he felt intimidated himself. Yeah. So, so um, let's go back to Sigurd's point. Maybe we can all jump in here. Uh, Epstein's dead. The best experience that we're describing is the opportunity to speak in open court to their truth and their pain, to acknowledge what happened to them. Um, do the, first of all, do they feel cheated by this? I'm thinking in many ways of the uh, Boston pedophile priest stories. There was one about uh, Father Gahan, who was strangled in prison in, in w awaiting uh, trial. And the victims were furious that some other inmate decided to take justice in his own hands. And yeah, they thought, you know, they didn't care about the life of Father Gahan, 
but they wanted to be the they wanted to be the reason he died. They wanted to be the reason that something happened to him. So I'm wondering whether, in addition to this, yes, they had this great experience in open court, were they cheated because of of the death? And then maybe we can also briefly touch on how did Epstein die? Was it a suicide or was it a hanging? Will we ever know? Why were the cameras malfunctioning? Why were the police, the detention officers asleep? Uh, it seems like he tried to kill himself a month before. He was on suicide watch for a short period of time, then he was off. It seems very mysterious. Well, certainly on behalf of the victims, they felt cheated. I mean, they were without question. Uh, they were very frustrated. You heard that in their statements. They felt like that was taken away from them. He had made them suffer for years upon years, and they wanted to see him in prison permanently. Um, so that was really difficult for the victims. And there's no way to get around that. It was taken from them uh, very unfairly. So uh, there was definitely that level of frustration um, that was pretty universal. I can remember getting the call that morning and it was actually one of my family members that asked me if I was watching TV. And I first, you know, initially when I saw it, reached out to one of my clients. And when she learned the news, she was literally in tears on the phone. She felt that this was the time, you know, she had been led to believe by the U S attorney's office. We've got him now. We've got him dead to rights. We're going to do the right thing this time that wasn't done 10 years ago. And to just pull the rug out from under these victims yet again, by allowing this to happen was just tragic to them. You know, I understand that, is there a French case that's being initiated by the French? I read something, please tell me this isn't true. Please, I want you to tell me this isn't true. <laughs> that for one of Epstein's birthdays, he flew in triplets, 12 year old girls for his birthday. 12 year old yeah. girls. I wish I could French tell you, I wish I they, could tell you that wasn't true. And, they, and then he flew them back at the end of the day. That is true. That is true. We have it in, in the film, actually, in Brad Edwards' deposition. He even asks him about it. Yep. Or he laughs and jokes it off or plays the fifth. But yes, uh, Virginia Giuffre was privy to that. You know, so so uh, that right. I, mean, yeah. I was reminded of several times, in, and it's also in your film, the quote from Donald Trump, you know, because apparently at some point he and Epstein consider themselves real sort of, you know, players in the New York, mm -hmm. you know, bachelor scene. And there's a really wonderful, wonderful quote from Donald Trump saying, yeah, you know, he's really great with the women, but he really likes them young. That's yeah, he likes beautiful, he yeah. likes beautiful women as much as I do. Many of them are on the younger side. Younger. Younger. Yeah, and that, that quote came out even before the prosecution started here in Palm Beach. Right. Yeah, yeah. Can we talk a little about uh, the Virginia Joffrey case. I, I don't know if that Sigrid is that that was your case is your case. Correct. Uh, I know that that's a case that has gotten a lot of attention. That's the one against Alan Dershowitz. Among other there's a there's a separate matter of a defamation case. Again, there's so many entanglements. This is yet a separate one. Is that still yours? No, I, I'm not handling the case for Virginia against Alan Dershowitz, but I am involved in the case uh, that is going on right now on behalf of Virginia against Gielan Maxwell, which is really the end of that case. That case settled in what's happening now are the documents, uh, the fight over the documents and the um, fight to unseal. Virginia wants the, that information to be unsealed. And so there's a battle that's been ongoing in the court over the unsealing of those documents. Lisa, the tapes, the tapes, it's got like a Watergate feel. Uh, uh, <laughs> I know, I can't tell you, tell me this isn't true, because I know this is true. Uh, uh, and in addition to all the intimidation and all the threats and all the payoffs, Epstein decided to do something else. He wanted to film everyone who came into his house and engaged in illicit, illegal behavior. So in a safe in his mansion in New York, here in New York, he has tapes of apparently everybody involved in something that isn't legal. Uh, what, where are those tapes now? Well, will, we ever, will we ever know about those tapes more? Will they ever be made public? Will we at least know who the tapes are of? Those are all great questions. And, you know, a number of the survivors in the series do talk about the, the, the cameras, you know, Maria Farmer talks about them, Sarah Ransom talks about them on the island, Virginia, you know, saw them all, you know, all over the place, you know, Haley Robson saw them. There, there's no doubt that 
in, in my mind anyway, uh, that there are tapes and there are probably multiple sets of tapes at this point. Um, he's not stupid to have one set of tapes locked in his New York mansion safe. Um, so who knows, uh, you know, the FBI could have that set of tapes. I, I'm not privy to that. Um, everybody, of course, uh, probably who might be concerned that they might be on those tapes are probably very worried and don't want those tapes out there. Um, Sigrid, perhaps maybe you could speak or, or, or Spencer a little bit more about what, what do we know about those tapes? Um, I think everybody certainly thinks they exist and would love to know uh, and see, you know, some of the names of people that were, were involved because it definitely means they, you know, had some sort of interaction, whether it be uh, sexual or not, um, with Jeffrey Epstein. Right, because it's important to keep in mind that I think all of you agree that whether you had sex with any of his uh, girls that he uh, brought in on the Lolita Express, the fact is if you showed up at any of those parties and you knew what was going on at those parties, you are complicit, at least in a moral sense. Now, law students know that there's no duty to rescue in the United States. So, you know, I, I wrote about this years ago in connection with the Penn State case for the Daily Beast because a number of people said, well, you know, what about Joe Paterno? It's so, well, you know, doesn't, he wasn't involved. He wasn't in the shower. And so therefore it's not clear what his obligation is other than a moral one. But I think everyone here agrees that if you showed up at the parties or if you were on a plane, you are complicit in some way. Well, Alan Dershowitz doesn't agree with that, does he? No, no he, he doesn't. doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. And, and yet there he is arguing for the release of the various documents that, uh, uh, that, that you would think he would be against the release of if indeed uh, he was incriminated in them. I don't well, know. Well, that's it's because, that you know, Mark, it's an interesting point. I'm speaking now as a law professor. He doesn't think so because he knows there's no legal liability for that. Right. So in his mind, he's thinking, well, I don't, I don't function on a moral plane. <laughs> You know, I'm functioning on a legalistic plane and a legalistic plane. This is not a, this is not unlawful. I could be on the plane and I could applaud every act that's being done. I can literally cheer it on. <laughs> Although I think there are some rules in state court at prosecutors that you can't entreat or encourage a crime. So I'm not sure about that. But but the point is, he's probably thinking it, it, it doesn't make any difference to me because it does. It essentially exonerates me on the main charge, not on the moral charge. But we, but we have this huge cast of prominent characters who you would think would be quaking in their boots about the possible release of whatever was in the video vault. And we know that the FBI, when they raided the house, uh, took away a whole bunch of stuff from the vaults, but we don't know if it was videotapes or what. Um, and, uh, and yet, like his money, I think we need to be a little cautious about the stories about the video uh, because he used the possibility of the video and the stories about the video wow. as a way of controlling all of those prominent people around him. It was effective. Uh, so I don't know whether we ought to believe that, the, that there are literally hundreds of hours of, of incriminating video or but, not. But, but, well, but the I, I can Brian, tell you that, yeah. sorry, I, I can tell you that when they executed the search warrant on his house here in Palm Beach, I spoke directly with Chief Ryder and he said that it was apparent to them that there were hard drives of computers that were missing and places where cameras had been and where wires were now cut. So he had been tipped to that. So we knew for a fact that there had been some video taken here in Palm Beach. Otherwise, why take away all of that equipment and, and right. why try to hide it during the investigation? All right, I don't wanna ask, not, not, not one of the four of you are psychologists, but I'm gonna ask you something that comes out of the point that Mark made about Dershowitz and something that is very present in the Lisa Bryant film, Filthy Rich, which is um, people absolutely declaring on camera or in some other way that I was not there. <laughs> and yet I was not there. And yet there are photographs in the movie, in Lisa Bryant's movie, of people being exactly there. Or there are gardeners or people who are in the staff that are saying, this is ridiculous. He was there several, you know, many times. What is it, what is the psychology here for these absolute denials when in fact you have demonstrable proof that rebuts the claim? I just don't, it seems the movie- Have you heard seems, the song, It Wasn't Me? Yeah, I, but, it, <laughs> but it, see, yes, but these are some things that are so self-condemning that you think, do you not know <laughs> that the manifests say that you're there, their witnesses say that you were there, you're there. 
It's, Why are you continuing to deny this? Is it, Mark, in terms of covering this, is this sort of the, the age in which we live? It's an age of denial and defensiveness. Look, no one ever acknowledges anything. That's look at the, look the, at the president of the United States. He, he routinely denies what he's said, whether it's on tape or not. I had a, a bizarre conversation with Dershowitz about this, uh, where he told me uh, just flat out, he, he said, I have never spent a night away from my wife since the day I was married. So if I went to the island, it would have to have been with my wife. And he denied that ever happened. So we have the flight, flight manifests. So I read them to him. He went, she did not. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, that was maybe just one night. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that it's the, the, the imperative that they feel is to deny. And, um, you know, so far it's worked for them. Lisa, uh, or actually Sigurd, maybe we should start with you on this question because you've raised points that, come, that, that reflect this. You know, look, it's such a vulgar tragedy, the story itself on every level. But any good that we can say came out of this? Is there anything? And when I ask you this, I'm wondering, when the case got revived in 2018, why was that? Was it because of the Me Too movement? If it wasn't for the Me Too movement, would, would the Southern District never arrested uh, of Epstein? Because we, you know, we saw that everyone, all of a sudden, all the old allegations against Harvey Weinstein became new, right? And I'm wondering whether the Me Too uh, 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 movement did the same thing with Epstein. It, it revitalized these charges and now we're taken more seriously. In my view, there was an absolute shift between the time when I started the case in 2015, where I said that the media was very adverse. Epstein, the Epstein machine was running hard at that point. So he would have reporters working for him. Uh, you know, it was a very different environment. And then once the, the Me Too happened and actresses were coming forward very boldly and saying, I, I've, I'm a victim of abuse, we saw a shift. We did. And I think people were more accepting at that point when, for example, the Miami Herald did their reporting and they sort of exploded information that had been present, as Spencer knows, for years and years. I mean, those message pads were part of the trash pull, you know, when they were investigating Epstein. And that information was out there, who was on the planes, but it hadn't been pieced together in that way. And the public wasn't, in my view, and the media wasn't ready to accept it until that point. So at that point, it was okay to talk about Sorry, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. When Alex Acosta, you know, became uh, Secretary of Labor, that was the turn, really, uh, uh, that I saw, uh, because it became a political matter as well. And then that's what the Miami Herald and Julie Brown did so so mag magnificently is made it put it in the political arena with with Trump and all the high players. Because remember, James Patterson wrote a book that came out long before that, and as a best selling author, it was largely ignored. Um, it had the same information told differently. Acosta was not there yet to, to frame it around. It was, it was ignored. It was put out there. It, it should have exploded then. It didn't. And I think by putting it, uh, framing it in the political sense that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that Miami Herald did. And then as we were, you know, kind of working sort of at the same time, we didn't come out so much later, but I think that that really was the turn in, in everybody grasping onto it. And, and then, you know, the outrage that came from that. Um, By the way, while talking about while talking about odd connections, I don't want anyone to forget when he was when he Epstein was at the Dalton School. Remember who the headmaster was? Believe it or not, it was Donald Barr, U.S. Attorney Barr's father, was the headmaster at the school where Epstein taught. So when you think of odd connections going back just years in this entire case. And then how it all comes to the present now with all of these connections with Acosta and U.S. Attorney Barr and all of the things going on. It's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, that, that is extraordinary, Spencer. It makes me think what I was saying before about the 2008 financial collapse, that it does seem that Epstein is almost like a zealot character. You know, he had a Ponzi scheme experience. He was involved in the 2008 financial collapse. He, the very firm he got his break at after the Dalton School, Bear Stearns, is the main bank that collapsed, uh, in part because the, the heads of the bank still invested with Epstein even after they let him go. Let's take some questions from the audience. This is from a, a, a psychotherapist, uh, and I, it, it ha it's essentially asking a question about his background. She says, 
uh, I am always interested in learning about an individual's family background, early childhood experiences, uh, relevant psychological data. Rarely does a person become a psychopath or sociopath without having serious pathological early relationships. In the series, unless I missed it, there was nothing mentioned about Mr. Epstein's early life. What do we know about what contributed to his criminal development? That comes from Roberta Brenner. Uh, I can speak a little bit to that. I mean, he grew up kind of poor uh, in, in Brooklyn, uh, poor by his standards in a very modest means. Um, I don't know if Mark, if you have anything to add there, but you know, I, I think his, his his family was average. But I, I think I think Ms. Brenner wants to know: Did he have tapes of his high school girlfriends? Not, not to our knowledge. I think that that what we discovered is it started, um, you know, at, right around the Dalton School. There, we did have reports. Uh, that there were some inappropriate relations with students at the Dalton School. Um, and I think that's where it happened. It really came, came out. He was dating, you know, uh, normal high school girls. He graduated two years early, actually, at the age of, of 16. So he was dating girls in high school. And we didn't hear of any, uh, you know, wrongdoing at that right. point. But, but not long after is when I think the first, you know, rumblings of that came about. All right, I have this question that I really like. This is from a woman named Hillary Nappy. And she asks, and this is, she said, this is for Spencer and Sigrid. Dealing with multiple clients of repeated sexual abuse can be morally draining on your soul. How do you find balance? Definitely well, a fair question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I, I say, yeah, I would say one of the things that has shocked me about being involved in, in this matter ongoing is really learning the resilience of the human spirit. I mean, it's been amazing to watch these women and to be able to go through the horrific abuse they went through and to still come out and be able to speak about it and try to turn their lives around uh, has been just a wonderful thing to witness. So uh, while there were many dark years, I don't wanna um, uh, lie about that <laughs> and many hard years, um, where we are now is really um, very motivating for me uh, to, to see how they've been able to come through this journey. And, and that's that certainly helped me along. Spencer, and I think, mentally, mentally, you're still okay, right, Spencer? Yeah, and mentally, I'm okay, thankfully, yes. But you know, one of the things that I think helped me along this entire process is knowing that I was out there fighting for them. So being able to confront Mr. Epstein face-to-face -face in a deposition, or being able to really fight against his lawyers and advocating for these girls, you know, it gives you a sense of purpose and, and you know that you're on the right side, even as the, the arrows and the barbs are coming at you, you still know that you're fighting for justice and fighting for something that's good for these young girls. What, um, before we say goodnight to the, our guests, this is one last question, Mark Singh. Can the panelists talk about what knowledge, I guess, information that's relevant for this whole story, they hope to come to light in light of the impending Maxwell case? In other words, does the Maxwell case, the, the documents, the case itself, if it proceeds in any way, is it going to be a smoking gun that with something that even, even will surprise everyone on this panel, which given the fact that I've asked you some questions and I said, please tell me it's not so, and you said, Thane, it's so, is there anything that we think Maxwell knows? Uh, I mean, she was Every always time. sort of a sinister character uh, you know, sort of very much a Lady Macbeth character in this uh, plot. Uh, is there something that she knows that no one else knows? Every time I think the last chapter is written in this book, there's another epilogue. It's just amazing how things continue to come. I think we're going to be continuing to learn information about this story for years to come. I don't think this is the end. And I think she has every incentive to, at this point, come forward with at least some of what she knows. Uh, and she really knows more than anyone else who's alive. I mean, she was the recruiter, the trainer, the groomer, uh, she's the paymaster, the organizer. And uh, by all accounts, uh, she, she knows it all. Uh, some of that, I, I imagine, Sigrid is, is going to be in some of these documents, but, but some of it is all in her head, and, uh, and, and whether she comes forward with all that is obviously what the prosecutors and the FBI are working on right now, and um, you know, otherwise they wouldn't have gone to all this effort. Hey, Lisa, if there was a Filthy Rich 2, uh, <laughs> could, you, could you make it on about Maxwell? Is there enough there? Because, I mean, I, her story being the daughter of, you know, I'm, I just remember the, how her the circumstances of her father's death on the Thames River 
many years ago. And, you know, yes. we touched upon it, her, her, you know, story. Yeah. And the women talk about the different ones because five out of the nine people we talked to did have either were recruited or had direct interaction with her. Um, certainly there's, there's plenty more and, um, um, we'll see what happens, but you know, it, it, things are happening at such a quick pace. Uh, you know, documentaries generally are planned well in advance. So we're kind of letting things play out a little bit before we decide, uh, you know, what's, what's going to happen. But certainly she is, uh, a, a case study right there in herself, uh, because I think as Sigrid knows, and, and I'm sure, um, Spencer as well and Mark, uh, you know, that some of the women feel more betrayed almost by her than by Epstein in a way she should have been a protector, a mother Interesting. Figure, and she yet brought them in knowing they were going to be sexually abused. And Great that. point. Where, where, where's the sisterhood there? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right, before we say goodnight to our guests, uh, let's just give you some information on upcoming events. Uh, Shervin, are you ready for us? Just quickly, there's a few more events coming up. In fact, something very soon. I think Sunday matinee. There, we're, there we go. Uh, is that is actually is that up? There it is. Yeah. Uh, another uh, conversations on essential cinema. We're going to be uh, uh, talking about Dr. Shivago. For those of you who've already signed up for this, you should be watching it between now and August second. It's Sunday, uh, two p.m. Uh, uh, matinee, and that face it belongs to Margarita Laviva, a young actress. She starred in HBO's Deuce and. She's now on a Netflix series that she stars in. Uh, and, and she was a, a young girl who left the Soviet Union and is now in the United States. And it'd be interesting to hear this actress's view of Dr. Shivago. And then what's next, Shervin? Well, there are probably going to be others. But yes, there, August 26th at 26th, yes, that's Sharon Stone. She'll be here uh, talking about Casablanca. Um, and so that would be enormously interesting. If there's going to be one actress who should talk about Casablanca, I think it should be Sharon Stone. And I should tell you, when I spoke to her, that's the film she wanted to talk about. So, uh, uh, so that's August 26th. There'll probably see be other programs in between. But and then, of course, uh, we have uh, and a deadline until July 31st, an extension for the Folks International Short Film Competition. Uh, it's one of our favorite things that we do every year. Films about social justice, 20 minutes or less, uh, on any genre, uh, documentaries, uh, 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 comedies, uh, animation. Uh, it's, we have a red carpet. I don't know if we'll have a red carpet next year. Uh, if we do, it'll be sanitized for sure. Uh, we give out the Folksy Award. Uh, and so if you know any aspiring filmmakers around the world, have them apply. Uh, they have until July 2031st. Um, Lisa, Mark, Spencer, Sigrid, Thank you so much for joining us for this folks conversation. Thank, uh, thank you so much for you, your crusading natures in each way. Each one of you have you very easily demonstrate over the last hour, uh, 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 you know, an interest in the truth, uh, an interest in justice. Uh, you're, you all taken on jobs that are in the business of truth telling, truth seeking. Um, and it really is to have all four of you here uh, again, it's not a victory, uh, but you know you stuck with this story <laughs> forever, and you're and as Spencer said, I, I think in Lisa's thinking, you know the story is yet not even finished. It will continue, and I really do hope for the victims that all four of you remain active uh, and that you remain in their lives uh, and continue to tell the truth. And thank you for giving us a story that frankly would we would not have known about if not for the four of you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Sigrid. Uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you're not yet a member of Folks on our email list, folks.org, sign up, and then you'll get all upcoming events. Uh, and you know, we've been, all, we've been free all summer in light of the pandemic. If you want to donate to a good cause, we're a good one. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night from Folks. Thank you. Thank you.